Well, good morning, South Point Church. It's good to be here today. It's good to see you guys here. Um, as Colette said in the beginning, this has been kind of a wild week for me and my family. On Tuesday morning at 7.36 a.m., uh, little Wyatt came into this world, and he came in screaming. And Casey, my wife, she had to work she had to work hard for it. And those women out there in the audience, you know what that's like. Uh, and my utmost respect to you guys um, the birth process is incredible. It also can look like someone slaughtered a donkey, but it's, it's an absolutely, absolutely incredible process. But unfortunately, Casey won't be here today because she's at home with the baby. But I just want to say that it's an amazing thing when I look at, uh, when I look at little White. He's just this tiny little worm. You know, he just sort of sits there, and sometimes his eyes are open, sometimes they aren't open. He can't hold his head up yet. And I look at him, and I think, like, man, you know, today... Even this little thing, this boy, is something that Jesus died for and Jesus gave his life for. And as I was preparing for today's message, I, I really thought like, man, the resurrection of Jesus, which is what we celebrate today, that resurrection was even for this, this little worm that we hold in our hands, this little thing that doesn't know anything yet about this world. Jesus knew him before he was formed in the womb and, and Jesus died for him and his love was for him. And today's Resurrection Sunday is even for him. I just think it's amazing that we don't have to do anything except just be born and come into this world. And when we come into this world, we just get to accept uh, the love that Jesus has for us. So Today, I really want to focus on the resurrection. I mean, it being Sunday, I mean, obviously we're going to talk about Jesus, and we're going to talk about Jesus uh, dying and hanging on the cross, and then the part, the best part of the story is when he is actually risen. We're going to talk about the resurrection, and what resurrection means is that Jesus was dead at one point, and then Jesus came back to life, and he rose from the grave. And I think that the resurrection is something that's extremely powerful, and it's powerful enough that we devote some time to it, and we talk about it today, because in fact, it's, it's not even worth talking about Jesus if we don't mention the resurrection. The story of Jesus is not even worth telling without the resurrection part. See, we can't separate out the resurrection from Jesus. We can't take away that, that part where Jesus raises from the dead and, and put that over to the side because that may offend or be weird or people may not accept that and just talk about these other things about Jesus and his life. We, we can't do that. The two come together. And if you take the resurrection away, it's not even really a story worth telling. And in fact, I would go on even further to say that the resurrection is the single thing that brings authority to everything that Christ did. It's that. It's the resurrection. See, without the resurrection, then all that you have is you have Jesus as a rabbi. Without the resurrection, Jesus is just another rabbi that happened to be clever enough to convince 12 people to follow him closely. He just happened to be a great teacher or an educator or really good at speaking in crowds. Maybe he got lucky a couple times and performed some miracles. Maybe some things kind of uh, aligned and he was able to, to do some stuff and, and people thought, wow, that's a miracle. And, and this rabbi thought like, whoo, I got lucky on that one. You know, when, when you take the resurrection away, Jesus is also just another Jew that was murdered at the hand of the Romans. That's who, that's who he is. When you separate out the resurrection, then all you have is just this regular guy that did, yes, he did amazing things, he did miracles, but you're taking away the most valuable thing about Jesus. The resurrection is the thing that, that we hang our entire religion, our relationship with God on. It's, it's everything. And so Jesus, he was this amazing man. Yes, he was. He was an incredible teacher. He did incredible things. He healed people. He, he, he traveled around and people flocked to him. You had crowds that just flocked to him. The blind were healed. People that had leprosy were healed. Uh, he, he taught things that were controversial. He spoke about love in a way that no one had ever, uh, that had, no one had ever even heard or been able to understand. I mean, there was a point where Jesus even proclaimed that he could forgive someone of their sins. And that really rocked the boat. But see, the problem with Jesus wasn't what he did. And it, and it wasn't necessarily what he taught, but it was what he claimed about himself. See, Jesus claimed that he was the, the Savior. He was the Son of God. Jesus claimed that he could forgive sins. Jesus claimed that he was coming to make a way for us to have a relationship with God. See, what Jesus was doing is Jesus was tearing down this old covenant. And he was trying to create this new covenant. 
And Jesus goes off and, and he does, starts his ministry and he does three years of this ministry claiming that he is the son of God. Claiming that he will tear down the temple and three days later build it up again. Now people could not understand that. Jesus was always foreshadowing the resurrection, but people could not wrap their mind around that. They couldn't understand that. It didn't make any sense. How is one man going to tear a temple down and then rebuild it? On what authority does Jesus teach and say the things that he does? See, Jesus walked in this authority that people did not understand. So I, I hope to paint a picture for you of this man, this Messiah, who claimed to be something that, that no one could really accept. Because he claimed to be something that no one had ever understood. He claimed to be God in flesh. How can this possibly be? But that's what he claimed. And Jesus, he went off and he started his ministry. And we find a couple key areas in his ministry. One, there's a story where Jesus fed 5,000 people. And the 5,000 people that Jesus fed, those were actually 5,000 men, which means that there were women and children there as well. So the number was way above 5,000 people. And as Jesus is feeding these people, it started with just a couple fish and a couple loaves of bread, and he blessed it, and it multiplied, and it multiplied. And after that happened, the crowds, they grew, and they grew, and they grew. And actually, Jesus had to remove himself from those crowds. Jesus had to take himself away, because he knew what the crowds wanted him to be. And he knew that he could not be exactly what they wanted him to be. And Jesus would go on and he would perform another miracle and another miracle. He would even go on and feed more people, feed another 5,000 people or so, just miraculously. And throughout Jesus' ministry, he starts to just build this following. He starts to build this movement. He starts to build this, this, uh, this incredible kind of thing that everybody could see. The Jewish leaders, they were terrified of him because Jesus was building this crowd and this crowd that was following Jesus around was dangerous because if they decided to, to turn on, on the Romans or they decided to turn on the Jewish system, then they could create all kinds of problems for people. And so you've got this man. I just want you to put yourselves in, in this day and time. You've got this man walking around, this, this regular looking guy. He's just as dirty as everyone else. He's wearing the same clothes as everyone else. He's walking around and he's doing amazing things. He's performing these miracles. He's teaching his disciples. See, the way a rabbi worked in, in those days is a rabbi would actually recruit disciples. They would recruit people to be trained and to grow and to learn under them. Now, the disciples that Jesus chose, if you can remember or if you don't remember, I'll tell you, but... Jesus recruited them out of like the secular world. So they, they didn't come from the temple. Jesus didn't go to the temple and say, give me your best 12. No, he walked around and he picked a fisherman and he picked a doctor and he picked a tax collector and he picked these people. But do you know why they were doing those things instead of working in the temple? It's because they were kind of rejects. They weren't smart enough to make it in the temple system to become a Pharisee or to be, be trained underneath another rabbi. So Jesus walks around practicing the same uh, traditions that a, a temple priest would practice, and he picks his 12. And with those 12, he walks around all of the, the land and does these amazing things. It just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense to anybody that can see it. And in fact, people try and make sense out of it. And they're going to continue to try and make sense out of it. And what happens is, is the people thought that Jesus was going to be there, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, I want you to imagine, if you're a Jew in those times, you have such a deep history. You have such a deep culture. Your culture and your history, it goes back all the way back to, to Sol King Solomon, King David. It goes back to Abraham. It goes all the way back to Moses. When Moses goes up onto the hill or onto the mountain and brings down the Ten Commandments. He goes back to even before that when the Israelites were captive in Egypt. And then Moses would come and lead them to freedom. See, when you're a person in the day and age of Jesus and you are a Jewish person, you are walking around part of a culture 
part of a, a religion, part of a system that is unquestionable, unshakable. It's been tried and true, and it's been tested over centuries of time. And, not one, and one person can't just come and undo that. But all of a sudden, one person does come, and they do start to undo that. And so people start to wonder, is this guy the Messiah? See, there were these prophecies in the Old Testament that Jesus would become the Messiah, or that the Messiah would come. And when the Messiah came, that Messiah would lead the people to freedom. And so what happened is the people thought that Jesus was going to be their mercenary, that he was going to be their, their leader, that Jesus was going to come in and he was going to release the people from Roman power, that Jesus was going to free everyone He was going to restore the order. He was going to place the Jewish people back onto the pedestal that they were on under King David and under King Solomon. And so many people thought this, and that's why Jesus, over and over and over again, he withdrew from the crowds. If you ever read the Bible and you wonder, why is he withdrawing from the crowds? Part of it is because he knows he needs to have this relationship with God. He needs to pray and do those things. But the other part is that Jesus knows the crowds are crazy. And he knows that, that as a crowd mentality, that this is like a bundle of dried wood. And all it takes is just a little bit of a spark, and the whole thing is going to go up in flames. And Jesus says, that's not why I came. That's, that's not why I'm here. That's not my purpose. I'm not here to be what the people thought that I was going to be. I'm here to be who, who I proclaim to be, which we'll learn about. So Jesus, he goes on throughout his ministry. He feeds the 5,000. He does the miracles. He heals people. He he heals people from the sick. And Jesus finds himself coming into Jerusalem. He's just been in in a little town called Bethany. Now, in Bethany, there was a man there named Lazarus. And many of us know, know this event. But Lazarus had died. And Jesus came three days later after Lazarus had died. And Jesus actually helped, helped, or he raised Lazarus from the dead. And when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, there was this incredible buzz around him. Now the crowds were just out of control. The crowds were just uncontainable. And it was so threatening to the, to the temple priest that they start really scheming. They say, okay, now we've got to make a plan to kill this guy. And then Judas, we've heard about Judas. We spoke about Judas a couple weeks ago. Judas sells Jesus out. He snitches on him. And he goes to the high priest and he says, I can get you Jesus without the crowd. And they say, okay, that would be great. It's exactly what we want. And so Judas creates a plan to do that. And after he creates this deal with the high priest, the people of Jesus and his followers, those people, they, they enter into Jerusalem for the Passover meal, which is this big celebration that they do every year. And when they come into town, Jesus takes them into an upper room And many of you know this story. And in that upper room, they have the Lord's Supper. And Jesus explains to them once again, he's going to die and then he's going to rise. But they don't understand it. They don't quite get it. And so Jesus is trying to have this conversation and explain these things to them. But their mind is like blocked. Because again, the people thought that Jesus was going to be their dot, 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 their idea of what a Savior or a Messiah was. It's like they weren't listening to him. He was dropping a breadcrumb of, of, of clues, but they just could not follow that. And so Jesus, he leaves the upper room, and they go to, to this beautiful garden, and it's nighttime, and, and he's going to pray. And he knows that in, in a very short period of time, he's going to be crucified and put on that cross. And so he goes to pray, and that's when Judas leads the high priest to him, and they arrest him. And now we get to this, this point in the story where things really start to, to come to light. Things really start to get good. And it's John 19, verse 16. And Jesus has now finally ended up in, in Pilate's hands. Pilate, who is in charge of representing the Romans. Him and, and Caiaphas, who is in charge of representing the Jewish people had been talking, and Caiaphas says, you got to kill this guy, you got to crucify him. Pilate says, well, we don't crucify people because of Jewish laws. They have to be breaking a Roman law. So Pilate can't find fault in him, so he sends him to Herod. Herod can't find fault in him, sends him back to Pilate. And Pilate's sitting there with his hands tied like, I don't know what to do with this guy. And in the meanwhile, Jesus is just not being who everyone thought that he was going to be. 
They thought this guy just needs to rise up. This guy just needs to take control. This guy needs to set himself free. Why? If he proclaims that he is the king of the Jews or if others proclaim that he is, then why is he allowing himself to go through this process, this painful process? And Jesus comes back to Pilate for the last time. And now watch what happens. Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So then the soldiers took charge of Jesus. And then the next verse, verse 17, carrying his own cross, he went out to a place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others. And then the rest of the verse says, When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. See, in, in this moment... Jesus died. This drink that they're talking about here, it, it was the fulfillment of a prophecy that said that he would drink of sour wine. And when you hung on the cross and you were thirsty, they would put a sponge that was soaked in this sour wine, and they would put it on the end of a stick, and they would lift it up to you, and you would take a drink from that. And I guess because it was sour wine, maybe it helped numb the pain for people. It helped them to, to, to maybe kind of get over some of the pain of the crucifixion. I mean, it wasn't designed to take it all away from them, but it was just, it was something for them. And Jesus, he takes a sip from that, and he says out loud, it is finished. And then he bows his head, and he gives up his spirit. See, the two people that were crucified on the side of him, they had to have their legs broken, because they were not going to give up their spirit. Jesus willingly gives up his spirit. He willingly dies. When Jesus dies on the cross, everything with him also dies. The prophecies die. The miracles die. All the teachings that he said die. All his followers that believed in him, all of those beliefs, they died. Everything that had been building over the last three years of Jesus' ministry, it died. If you were a follower of Jesus, when Jesus bowed his head on the cross and he gave his last breath and he said, it is finished, it was done. Jesus died and everything you believed in for the last three years was gone. He, it also died. See, we, because we know the Bible and because we've read the Bible, it, it's easy for us to just glaze over this point. Because we know what happens in the story. We know Jesus comes out of the tomb. But can you imagine being a follower of Jesus and you don't have, have the foresight to know that Jesus is going to walk out of that tomb. And you watch this man die and you just think, how on earth can this be? It's gone. It's gone. And in fact, after that, Jesus, he does, he fully dies. They stick a spear in his side to check. And when they do that, both blood and water come out. And that, that tells the, the, the soldiers that Jesus was already dead. That they didn't have to kill him. He willingly gave up his spirit. And then there's these two great men, Joseph and Nicodemus. And they come and they come to Pilate and they say, Can we take the body down from the cross and can we give it a burial? Now this was a really, really, really big ask. Because if you were crucified, you were not given a burial. You were taken out to the outer limits of town and you were dumped. And when you were dumped, it was just known that, that the dogs and the wild animals would consume you. Your bones would just kind of fall into the ground and you would just disappear like you never existed. That's what happened when you were crucified. And so as John is at the foot of the cross, and as Mary is at the foot of the cross, and Jesus' mother is at the foot of the cross, and Jesus looks down at them and says, John, take care of my mom. And then he gives his last breath and he lets his spirit go and he dies. Everyone knew that that was it because not only was he dead, but he would be taken outside the city walls and he would just dissolve into oblivion. He would no longer exist. There would not even be a trace of him that would exist. Jesus is gone. He's finished. And so Nicodemus and, and Joe, they come and they grab him. And Pilate says, okay, you can have the body. Nicodemus was very influential. And they take him out. And because they're kind of in a hurry, they bring 100 Roman pounds to come and, and embalm Jesus. 
Now, one Roman pound was the equivalent to 12 ounces. I'll let you guys do the math. I'm not going to try and do that here on stage. I have a baby at home. We're not sleeping in my house. But, but this just, again, proves the finality of Jesus' death. They wrap him in a hundred Roman pounds worth of, of, of fabric and wrappings and spices and fluids. They embalm this guy. That, that's to preserve him for, forever. That's to let him decay in this cave in a controlled way, to cover the smell. Jesus was not asleep. Jesus was dead. There, there are written accounts of this. I mean, that's part of what the, the four Gospels are, is people that saw this, saw Jesus die, saw him pulled down from the cross. They have the records of Jesus and the cave and the tomb. And they embalm him, and they put him in, in this cave, and they have to hurry. And I always thought that this was so funny. They're in a rush. And the reason that they're in a rush is that the holy Sabbath, the holy uh, holiday, is, is it starts at sunset. So they don't want to be bad Jewish people, even though they just put Jesus on the cross. They don't want to be a bad Jewish person and break a law and break a rule. And so they're rushing. They put Jesus in the tomb. They embalm him. They seal it. Now Jesus is there. He's dead. A night goes by. The next day, Mary, she comes to the tomb. And when she gets there, she didn't expect to see a resurrected Jesus. See, no one expected the resurrection. No one. Do you think that if Nick and Joe expected the resurrection, they would have embalmed Jesus? No. I would have put Jesus in a track suit. One of those tearaway track suits so that when he decided to poke an eye open, he could have just torn it away and come out of the tomb and been ready to go. If, if, if Nick and Joe thought Jesus was going to come back in a resurrection, they wouldn't have wrapped him so well. They wouldn't have embalmed him. They wouldn't have wasted the time and the material on that. If Mary expected a resurrection, she would not be coming the, the following day, which would have been about, uh, which would have been three days later. And the reason she was coming then is because the Passover was done, and now she could. She could work. She could do something. The Sabbath was broken. So she would not be coming to the temple to finish up embalming Jesus because she knew that Nick and Joe had rushed the process. So if she expected a resurrection, then why would she be walking to the temple to do that? In the meantime, guess what's happening with the disciples? They're all hiding because they're terrified. Do you know why they're terrified? Because they watched the guy that said he was the Savior die. And they're afraid that they will follow suit. So they have locked themselves in a house. Someone that expects a resurrection does not do that. If they expect a Jesus to resurrect himself, I just can't imagine that they would hide behind a locked door. No one expected a resurrection. It's so important that we grasp this idea that when Jesus died, there was finality to everything that he said and he stood for, and it died with him. And so Mary, she comes to the tomb, and she sees that the rock is taken away. The tomb is open, and she looks inside, and there's two angels inside. And these angels are talking to her, and, and she thinks they're like the gardeners. And she's terrified. She doesn't understand. And then all of a sudden, somebody behind her says something. And she turns around, and it's Jesus, but she doesn't recognize him. He was hidden in her sight. And she thought, oh, this, this, this gardener, what have you done with the body? Please tell me. Please tell me where you've taken him. See, Mary did not expect a resurrection, even with an open tomb and a missing body and a Christ behind her greeting her. She still had no clue of a resurrection. And Jesus has to continue talking to her. Finally, she says, Rabbi? Teacher? And that's when Jesus says, you can't come to me and give me a hug yet, because I've not ascended to my Father. And it's so interesting that he said, hey, hey, hang on, don't hug me just yet. I know you want to. I know, I know that, that the weight of what you're seeing is, is sitting on you. It's just being revealed to you. But don't, just, you can't hug me yet. And Mary, she runs back to the disciples. 
And she tells them, and they're, they're behind this locked door. They're in this locked house still. And she runs back, and she runs in, and she says, I've seen Jesus. He's alive. He is risen. And they, they don't believe her. They don't believe her. To the disciples, even when the mother of Jesus has left the empty tomb, spoken to two angels, had Jesus revealed to her, runs to where the disciples are hiding and barges in and says, He is risen, just like He said He would. He is risen three days later. The disciples still do not expect a resurrection. And so then, uh, I'll read this verse for you. I, I, wanna, I want you guys to experience this. So, Jesus, in, in John 28, this, this is talking about John. And John and Peter had run to the temple or had, had run to the tomb with Mary. And in verse 8 it says, So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb, and this is, this is John, he's talking about himself and John, also entered. And then he saw and he believed. So Mary had this experience. And then John and Peter, they had run to the tomb based on what Mary had said. And they, John had this experience because he saw the linens unwrapped and he saw the, the, the face cloth taken off of Jesus and, and they were laid nicely out into the tomb. And they, they have this experience, but they still, even though it says here that John, he believed, he, he did not quite understand or believe in this idea that Jesus had fully resurrected. And so then Jesus is, is, is deciding that he's going to reveal himself to the disciples. Now, th this is where this gets so good for us. This is where it becomes personal to us. This is where it becomes personal to you. And this is where I'm going to ask you to plug yourself in and to really think about this. So Jesus, he appears to the disciples. He does it in this incredible way. He, he passes through the locked door. Now, now this means he, he, he literally walked through walls. He walks through the wall and he's standing behind the, the, the disciples. And he says, peace be with you. And all the disciples, I can imagine, they had this huge fright. And they turn around and they see that it's Jesus. Jesus has now revealed himself to the disciples and he talks to them and, and he confirms in them and they see that he has the imprint of the nails on his hands and they see that he has the imprint on, on his ankles where he was hung on the cross and they see the, the scars and they see that there's a, a hole in his ribs where the spear went in. They see all of this. And when the disciples see that, they believe. It's when the disciples encounter Jesus that they finally believe in the resurrection. See, it took Jesus showing up in person for the disciples to believe. Finally, the resurrection is something that they can understand and wrap their head around. And Jesus goes on to tell them He's going to give them the Holy Spirit, which is a helper, which is going to be an advocate for them and, and their relationship with God. But here's what's so, here's what's so wonderful. And I'm so glad that God did it this way and that Jesus did it this way. I'm so glad that, that it happened this way because this is where we can identify ourselves. You guys know the story of Doubting Thomas? Man, Doubting Thomas was such a downer. I, I, you know, all the other disciples believed in Jesus except Thomas. This poor oak here somehow got the reputation of being Doubting Thomas. And the way that he got the reputation of being Doubting Thomas is because he wasn't there when Jesus appeared to the disciples. So then when Thomas comes in and he's around the, the disciples, they're trying to tell him that Jesus came, Jesus came. And Thomas is saying, no, 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 I don't believe that. And we'll actually look in, in verse 24 here in John. But Thomas, one of the twelve, who was called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, this is important, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. So what Thomas has done is Thomas has given conditions to what it would take for him to believe that Jesus had resurrected and that Jesus was there. Even though that there was a report from the other disciples that Jesus had, had risen and Jesus had shown up, Thomas is saying, I, I don't believe that. 
In fact, I, I've got to see it to believe it. But you know what Thomas had? As I thought about this, I thought, man, this is so perfect for us. See, Thomas was experiencing an impersonal resurrection. I need to see it to believe it. See, the resurrection of Jesus was not personal to Thomas because Thomas had not seen it. Thomas had not encountered Jesus. Thomas had only heard about Jesus. Thomas still had this list of requirements that needed to be met in order for him to believe that Jesus had truly risen and been resurrected. Thomas is just like us, and we are just like Thomas. We all doubt. We all struggle. We've all doubted the resurrection. Anytime you've doubted, is God there? Is Jesus there? Does He hear my prayers? You're doubting the resurrection. Anytime you doubt uh, Christianity or you see a bad Christian, and you say, man, is that worth it? Is this religion, is this thing even worth it? Look at all these bad people that claim to be Christians doing all this bad stuff out there. You know what? Bad people make people doubt a perfect relationship with Jesus. See, we have conditions for us to believe in the resurrection. And Thomas is explaining these conditions. And he's saying, until my conditions are met, the resurrection of Jesus is impersonal. It's just something that I've been told about. But it's not something that I've experienced. And so, eight days later, we come to my favorite part in this story. Eight days later, his disciples were again inside. And this time, Thomas is with them. Then Jesus came. The doors having been shut, meaning he passed through the walls, passed through the doors again. You see, that's so cool that Jesus was just, he could have used the door, but he didn't. He wanted to sneak up on them. And so he stood in their midst, and again, he said, because the jump scare worked before, so he's going to do it again. He says, peace to you. And then Jesus goes on, and in the, in the next verse, then he said to Thomas, remember Thomas's conditions? Remember all the things that Thomas said, I need to see this for the resurrection to be real? Jesus says to Thomas, place your finger here and see my hands. Take your hand and put it into my side. And do not continue in disbelief, but be a believer. See, Thomas went from having an impersonal resurrection to having a personal resurrection. And Thomas's reply to Jesus after this personal resurrection is, My Lord and my God. See, for, for all of us in this room, I think the greatest challenge that we have when it comes to the story of the resurrected Jesus is that we know it. And we've had people tell us about it. And we've had people tell us how amazing it was. And you've come to church Easter after Easter after Easter after Easter. And someone has stood up here and tried to convince you that the resurrection was real. Well, you know what? I can convince you that the world is round, but there's still people out there that believe it's flat. No amount of science, no amount of proof can fill the gap. And, and can fill your need for a personal encounter with Jesus. And now when you have an encounter with Jesus, you have an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. And now the resurrection, because you've had this personal encounter with Jesus, it moves from something that's impersonal, something you've heard about, something other people have told you about. And now it steps, and you step into it, and it becomes this personal experience that you've had with your Lord and Savior. And out of that, you're no longer saying, I'll see it when I believe it. Instead, what you're saying is my Lord and my God, because you have been changed by your interaction with Jesus. That, that to me is the hardest thing about what I do up here on a Sunday morning. Because my greatest desire is not to convince you of something, because then you can be unconvinced of it. My greatest desire is not to give you goosebumps, because there's plenty of, of movies and, and motivational things out there that can do that. My greatest desire for being up here is not to get you to like me. My greatest desire is not to be an amazing entertainer. My greatest desire up here is to represent the fact that we all need Jesus. And you know what's amazing about Thomas? Thomas gets called Doubting Thomas because he was the one that doubted out loud to the other disciples. But you know what? None of the disciples believed Jesus until they saw him. Thomas wasn't the only one doubting. It was all of them. 
And it's all of us that doubt until we have a personal experience and a personal encounter with the resurrected Jesus. Then we all can believe. We all can proclaim, my Lord and my God. So what I want to do for us today is I'm going to put a lot of trust and a lot of faith and a lot of hope in one thing right now in this moment. I'm going to put an enormous amount of trust and faith and hope into the reality that God, God and Jesus loves you, loves you more than I could ever love you. And that God and Jesus loves you more than you could love yourself. And that God and Jesus cares more about you and your soul than this church could ever care about you and your soul. And I'm going to take you and I'm going to trust God. And I'm going to put you in His hands. And the only thing that I'm going to ask for you to do this morning is consider, would you accept a personal encounter with Jesus so that you can have a personal resurrection? So that the resurrection can be made personal in your life. Now, I don't know what that would mean for you. You know, the resurrection becoming personal in your life means that you've just bumped up against the glory and the goodness and the love of Jesus Christ. And maybe that changes everything about you. Maybe it sets you free from addiction. Maybe it, it, it sets you free from pain and hurt and from past relationships. Or maybe it just causes you to quietly think and consider that there is something greater than you that loves you unconditionally no matter what. See, Jesus, when no one expected a resurrection, Jesus, He just kept walking along and he revealed himself over and over and over and over again and he made his resurrection personal to everyone all the disciples who would then go out and and spread the church across the entire world everything that we do as as a church and as Christians comes from the fact that the resurrection was made personal to us and the resurrection was made personal to them and so I'm going to ask you guys to bow your heads and, and close your eyes. And, and in this moment, th there's, nothing, there's nothing magical here. This is just a quiet moment. It's, it's just a, a quiet moment for you, a quiet moment for me. Because remember, I, I'm just trusting God here. I'm just the guy that's in front of you, but I'm trusting God, that God will work in this room. Somebody in this room needs to move from an impersonal resurrection to a personal experience with the resurrected Jesus. And when the band comes out, they're going to lead us in a song, and that's an amazing opportunity for you to have a personal encounter with Jesus. And so what I want to know is, is I'm going to say a prayer for you, and then I'm going to ask you a question. And then after that, I'll say another prayer, and then, then we'll call the band out. But Lord, I pray over this room right now. I pray over every heart in here. You know their hearts. You know, you know everyone that's in here. And you know everyone that's watching online. And I pray, Father, that you would just start poking hearts. And that you would start loving people. That you would place your tender hand on their shoulders. I pray, Father, that your love would cover their, their hurts, cover their pain like a blanket. Like the warmth of your love would just fill this room, Lord. So move throughout this room, Father. And so everyone in here with your head down, your eyes closed, I'm just going to ask you a simple question. If you would like to have a personal encounter with the resurrected Jesus, if you would like to move from impersonal, I need to see it to believe it, to personal, I mean my God and my Savior, if, if, if that's you, then I would just like you to just quietly slip a hand up. And the reason I ask you to do that is just so that I can pray for you. No one's going to call you up front. No one's going to ask you to sign anything. No one's going to ask you to, to do anything. I'm not going to point you out at all. And if you feel like you want a personal encounter with Jesus, like your life needs that personal encounter, but you don't want to raise your hand, that's also okay. Some people just like to, like to take action on that. So if you are looking desperately for a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Just slip your hand up so that I can pray for you in this prayer. Lord Jesus, I just wanna pray over everyone out here that, that wants an encounter with you. I pray over everyone, Father, 
that just wants to move from impersonal to personal. I pray, Father, that your resurrection just hits people and hits people hard. I pray, Lord, just a prayer of thanks and gratitude that you're so good that even when no one else believed, you chased us down and you proved yourself. Lord, you are so good and you are so wonderful. And we pray this in your name, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And so now the band is going to...